Welcome to The Picklist, the podcast for curious food industry minds. I'm Julia Glotz, a writer, editor, and consultant specializing in food and drink. Every week, I'm joined by an expert guest to discuss the news, trends, and developments shaping food and grocery retail right now. You'll get a personal perspective on how business leaders and leading thinkers from different parts of our industry are making sense of the big issues. My guests will also share what's on their personal reading list, bringing you a curated selection of thought-provoking articles from the trade press, national media, and other titles. You can find links to all the articles and suggestions for further reading in the episode show notes and also on thepicklist.co.uk. Now let's start the show. Hello and welcome to episode 51 of The Picklist. I hope you're having a good week. My guest this week is Paul Hargreaves, founder and CEO of Cotswold Fair, a wholesaler of specialty and fine foods. Paul is passionate about the idea of business with purpose. He has written a book on how to create a better world through purpose-driven business called Forces for Good, and recently published a second book about compassionate leadership called The Fourth Bottom Line. His own company is also a certified B Corp, and Paul talks to me about how having a clear, common purpose across the business has made a big difference during the pandemic and the supply chain crisis, how it's helped him secure new business, and even helped retain staff more easily. We also talk about the pitfalls of greenwashing and purpose washing and how to avoid those, and why Paul believes we need to ask tougher questions of big corporations and challenge our capitalist system's addiction to growth at all cost. I really enjoyed talking to Paul, and I think you'll find it really interesting to hear his take on how to build a more compassionate, purpose-driven business. So that's coming up in a moment, but first let me bring you up to speed on some of the big headlines from food and grocery retail this week. The latest Kantar grocery market figures were out and showed that grocery price inflation in the four weeks to the end of October stood at 2.1%. That's the highest since August 2020. Kantar said inflation was rising particularly fast in categories like snacks, crisps and canned colas, but falling in categories like fresh bacon, vegetables and pet treats. MS CEO Steve Rowe has become the latest retail boss to reassure customers about availability in the run-up to Christmas. Speaking as MS announced its latest financial results, Rowe said the retailer was in a good position going into the festive period and didn't expect problems with availability. He particularly emphasised that there wouldn't be any shortages of pigs in blankets at Marks & Spencer at all. He did, however, warn of more inflation across the food sector. The financial results themselves for the 26 weeks to the 2nd of October were very positive, with revenues up 5% year on year and food sales up 10.4% and a return to profit. US grocery delivery service GoPuff launched in the UK this week after acquiring existing services Fancy and Deja. GoPuff is starting out in 10 UK cities, including London, Birmingham, Cardiff and Newcastle, and aims to have 33 locations by the middle of next year. It was recently valued at $15 billion. A consumer survey by Asda suggests price remains the biggest reason people aren't making greener choices when buying products in supermarkets. 50% of the 3,000 consumers surveyed said they would be unwilling to pay extra for more sustainable versions of everyday items like milk and bread. Morrison's has launched a trial adding seaweed to cow's feed rations to help reduce methane emissions. The trial will be run in partnership with Queen's University Belfast and will assess how adding seaweed affects cow's health and the taste of meat alongside emissions. It comes as the US and Europe agreed at COP26 to cut methane emissions by 30% by 2030 as part of efforts to fight climate change. Quaker Oats have become caught up in the disruption caused by a recent IT systems upgrade at owner PepsiCo, which has already caused supply issues for walkers. After shoppers complained about availability problems on social media, PepsiCo confirmed Quaker Oats had also been affected by the disruption. 
And finally, Aldi unveiled its Christmas TV ad campaign for 2021, featuring footballer and food poverty campaigner Marcus Rashford alongside Kevin the Carrot in a storyline inspired by a Christmas carol. The ad also highlights Aldi's partnership with Neighbourly. These are some of the big headlines this week. You can find links to all the stories I mentioned in the show notes and also on thepicklist.co.uk. And now, here's my conversation with Paul Hargreaves. Paul, welcome to The Pick List. Thank you for being my guest. Looking forward to this. Pleased to be here. Now, you are the founder and chief executive of Cotswold Fair, a very well-known wholesaler of specialty and fine foods. And you are someone, I would say, who I often see commenting on big industry trends. I see you quoted on food trends all the time. But you're particularly well-known in the industry, I think it's fair to say, for your views on purpose what it means to be a purpose-driven business. You've written a book on that. Yes. Uh, Your own business is a certified B Corp. And you're very interested in working with suppliers and finding products that have a sense of purpose, whether it be around the environment or social causes. So I'm really interested to talk to you about this in a bit more detail today. And you have picked some great articles that will allow us to dive into purpose and particularly environmental purpose in a bit more detail. But I want to quiz you first about your fir- personal journey into the food industry because you have an MA in zoology, which doesn't immediately scream, I'm going to be working in fine foods. How how did that happen? Well, the zoology or the fine foods. <laughs> um, the zoology was, was really just, uh, I was interested in biology at school and uh, because it's quite a long time ago I did my degree there wasn't actually that much you could do with it apart from teach it and research it so my first step after that was to end up in the the charitable sector which I did for about 13 years in southeast London and really the fine food side was a pure accident I was running out of money needed to feed my children so I needed to do a bit on the side of the the charity stuff which had funds had dried up for various reasons and started selling some products from the Cotswolds to small retailers in and around London and the southeast and it was only really intended to be a, a sideline bit of extra cash pay the bills etc but I could say it was all very well planned and I had a master plan but that would be lying and I don't want to do that on the <laughs> podcast so it, it it really was luck um happened to start that at around the time that fine food was becoming a much bigger thing farm shops were emerging everywhere and just happened really to be in the the right place at the right time so it, it went fairly quickly from being just a little sideline to to growing rapidly getting premises getting people etc cetera, etc cetera. and that was we started properly in 99 and I was fiddling around a bit for a few years before that, but the business started proper in, in 1999. And you say you, you grew very quickly. And in fact, you've expanded more recently as well with a new enterprise and a new shop. Uh, tell us a little bit about what you've been up to. Yeah, so well, we've, we've grown massively during COVID. Obviously, the, the conditions have been perfect for us in that we're supplying retailers and you know, the higher end retailers. And of course, as everyone knows, people have been eating better food at home during the, the pandemic. So butchers, farm shops, food halls, convenience stores, the, the good ones have all been really, really busy. And they're, of course, our, our main customers. Um, so it's been a struggle to to get stuff into them sometimes. But um, I think one lasting legacy of the pandemic will be people are, are eating better food at home and people are shopping more in their local community which is fantastic and you know part of our purpose as a company actually is to is to get people more shopping in their local communities and of course it's had a knock-on effect of being great for business but um yeah you mentioned the the shop I, I guess this has been a probably a long-standing dream of mine but I haven't really done much about it um but a few years ago the opportunity came up due to a collaboration of farmers collapsing couldn't agree amongst themselves on on what to do and there's this very very good site between Bristol and Bath on a very busy road it's the A4 actually and we 
got presented with the opportunity to 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 come in on the on the project and that's what we did so again we did all the building during covid which had its challenges of course uh, and finally opened actually probably perfectly timed it was six months later than planned but finally opened in june this year which was just at the end of the the last kind of proper lockdown and uh, we've had people queuing to get in on most days of the week since then it's been absolutely unbelievable i think people were just had a pent-up energy to to get out and go and eat out rather than eating at home and uh, the timing again was was very fortuitous on all that yeah and and so because you, you've got a restaurant as, as part of the shop as well is that right yes we've got 120 covers um when it's wow. raining and a some more when it's the sun shining outside but um yeah it, it's been uh, we've been blown away with the the success so we obviously didn't expect it to be that busy didn't have enough people uh, i think we started with about 36 with now up to 61 people down there and you can imagine without enough front of house and kitchen staff the um the service wasn't great for the first few weeks but um customers were pretty understanding they knew we just opened knew we were really busy and and we're yeah we're up to a, a full house now and it's going really well just just coming up to our first Christmas which is another unknown quantity of course <laughs> yeah and I, I, I you know you obviously talked about some of the labor challenges that really are, are sort of across the industry at the moment how has the supply chain disruption affected you and, and particularly some of the smaller suppliers that you work with on the wholesale side massively probably I mean our, our fulfillment's way down on what it what it normally is and it's nothing you know uh, we've got a full complement of warehouse pickers and, and drivers so the goods just aren't coming in quick enough and of course this is the busiest time of year yeah with Christmas on top of all the all year round stock so um yeah it's been really challenging it's got slightly better I'm touching wood as I say this slightly better over the last few days um but uh, yeah, it's not been smooth sailing whatsoever. I can imagine. And, and I, when I introduced you, I talked about this focus on purpose, which has been a sort of running thread through through your career. And I suppose being a purposeful leader also includes leading and guiding your, your staff through things like supply chain disruption and uh, helping them sort of... Um, I guess, sort of keep their chin up when, when circumstances are, are incredibly tough. How have you approached that as, as a business leader? And how have you stayed positive um, as much as possible? Well, the, the best way of illustrating that really is we had a huge, and I'm pleased what you said about purpose, because if, if I'm known as that, happy days. It hasn't always been the case. I started the company with purpose. And then I started it with a, another a business partner, actually, and he, he'd had enough after a couple of years. We weren't, weren't making any money and he left. Um, and, uh, you know, I was probably a bit overwhelmed at that point and, and went away from our original purpose because we did actually start with three out of the first five uh, employees having basically been probably unemployable for most people. So we were trying to give them a chance. So fell away from it. We had a massive meltdown in 2014 company almost disappeared completely challenged my personal purpose and made me realize actually we haven't got any purpose in the company and uh, soon after that we became a b corp and that's mm. maybe talk a bit later on that but that that's really helped us frame our purpose as a company and massively massively helpful so in 2019 um we actually moved uh changed our whole logistics moved warehouse and the aim of that was to reduce our carbon impact. And we took off a couple of million miles off our, our deliveries, which was great. But, and everyone knew that, absolutely committed to it. It all went not as pear-shaped as 2014, but probably not far off it. it. It went horribly wrong, real struggle, horrible two or three months in the company. That was about six months before COVID. So, but the difference was in 2014, loads of people left. <laughs> who'd left a sinking ship at that point in 2019 everyone absolutely pulled together and it was amazing to see to be honest though it was tough really really tough but because everyone knew why we were doing it the carbon reduction and you know there's just a sense of we're doing the right thing everyone absolutely pulled together yes it was stressful 
no, it wasn't pleasant, but mm. no one left. And we came out of that much, much stronger. And I, I do think it's almost like we had a kind of pandemic in 2019. So when tough times came again, six months later, we were in a much stronger, resilient position and got loads of stuff thrown at us during COVID as, as everyone else did and, and actually came out of that really, really strong. We've, we've actually doubled the business since March 2020. It was only last year, wasn't it? Yes. I know. Um, yeah, so it <laughs> seems longer ago than that. I, I think that's fascinating, though, what you were saying about how actually having that purpose and having having it clearly communicated across the organization then actually helped you retain staff when when the going got got tough as well did you find that it gave you personally a purpose as well or made it easier to stay motivated uh, during those tough times yeah so I mean, in in 2014 i kind of probably went through a bit of a, a personal crisis as well in terms of what is my identity was too mm. tied up with my position and what i did rather than who I was. Um, so I had to kind of work. And then I had malaria soon after that, which which wasn't great and uh, ended up in hospital for a while. Okay. Um, so I, I, all those kind of things were coming at once and it, it kind of reassessed what I was doing with my life. It sounds a bit like a midlife crisis. Maybe it was. Um, but yes, I mean, I now absolutely feel that the company is is really aligned with my personal purpose, which is looking back and I went on a, a spiritual walk in, in India which helped help me get to this um, is all, all around injustice as I've always been really upset at injustice even as a little kid I remember being upset about certain situations near where I grew up in Manchester and uh, yeah I think that's really been the, the golden thread through my whole life actually obviously led me into the charity work and then the the business and now because we are fighting injustice in various ways and and hopefully doing something about it in some places then it it just feel everything feels very much aligned probably more now than it ever has in my life actually that's great to hear. Now, we do want to dive into your sense of purpose and particularly your view on environmental purpose in a bit more detail because you've picked some interesting articles uh, to, to help us discuss those. I just want to quiz you a little bit on uh, your reading habits first, though. What do you like as a reader? What publications do you read to keep up on industry trends and what types of stories tend to capture your attention? Um, well, industry trends, obviously, the grocer, and then there's a couple of magazines in the, the specialty uh, world, specialty food magazine, Fine Food Digest. That's probably it in terms of I get sent a few others and flick through them, but they're probably the three I I mainly read. Um, newspaper of choice is, is The Guardian, uh, which is actually a B Corp as well. And I, I do read quite a lot. Um Biographies, uh, autobiographies, I I enjoy. So just at the start of the, yeah, again, interesting timing. I'd never read Martin Luther anything really about Martin Luther King, and I was I was re actually reading that in February and March, 2020, and massively inspired by that. Obviously, God, I'm getting emotional talking about this, but um, <laughs> yeah, again, it taps into the injustice side of things and um obviously we had black lives matter of course soon after that so yeah i've used yeah, his um, work quite a lot in the last last 18 months uh, nelson mandela for my second book fourth bottom line that that was massively inspirational so um yeah anything inspiring <laughs> ticks the box <laughs> You are also, we, we've spoken before when I've written journalistic articles, um, and I'm always interested in how business leaders approach speaking to journalists. And my impression was, you're quite a relaxed guy, and you are not someone who is worried about talking to journalists or talking to the media. Were you always like that? Or was that something you had to learn? Did you go through media training or things like that? Oh, no, 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 no. Never had any media training. Um, I, I, I probably quite enjoy talking, <laughs> which helps, doesn't it? I'm probably so far it too much does. a journalist, to be honest with you. So um, I have got in trouble a couple of times with my PR company for saying too much. But <laughs> look, I mean, I 
you know, there's so much, not so much now, actually, but most of my business career, there's there's so much kind of, um, not, not oh, hypocrisy, it's a bit strong, but people don't give their whole selves. You get this kind of work mode person rather than the, the genuine, authentic whole person. And it's, you know, it's a much better conversation and interview if you're actually bringing your whole self to it rather than this kind of box of things you meant to say isn't it I would certainly agree with that yes absolutely now let's talk about your first article and it's a piece from the Guardian it's from George Monbiot and the headline is capitalism is killing the planet it's time to stop buying into our own destruction and just for the purposes or for the benefit of the listeners, I'll quickly summarize some of the key points here. So what George Monbiot talks about here is what he sees as a glaring disconnect between the scale of the environmental crisis we face and our willingness to do anything meaningful about it. So we're willing to do what he calls micro-consumerist bollocks, like ditching single-use plastic bags. But he fears that we're not looking at the big picture. We're not asking tough enough questions about the system that's brought about this environmental crisis in the first place. And this lack of looking at the big picture and asking those tough questions has two consequences primarily, he says. First of all, it means we're just not doing enough and we're not doing it quickly enough. But second, he worries that we're focusing on the wrong things. And in particular, that we're overemphasizing personal responsibility. So asking individuals to calculate their carbon footprint or to do their bit for the planet instead of holding big corporations and the super rich to account. Paul, why did you pick this article? What about it caught your eye? Well, primarily because it ties very much into a book I have just read called Less is More by Jason Hickel. And it's ties in very much the whole problem of capitalism and the inequality with with climate change that was the real reason i picked it george Monby also did biology at zoology sorry at uh, brasenose college and showed me around on my first day so oh, wow um I i'm not still in touch with but i'd absolutely love most of what he writes anyway but um i think the danger with things like cop 26 is that it's focusing perhaps too narrowly on 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 carbon, whereas the the, the issue we have um, in the world currently is all to do with the the whole system of capitalism and inequality, and and you know all the the people suffering most um, due to climate change are all in countries that over the last two three hundred years. Western nations have extracted resources and people, of course, in the, the slave trade and um, and stolen, in effect, from them, um, made themselves very strong and powerful. And now, guess what? In those talks, the strong nations who have done most damage have most sway on what happens, including large corporations. And I found out today, and this is an absolutely shocking stat, by the way, the largest group of people at COP26 are the fossil fuel lobby. There's 503 people who are lobbying from the fossil fuel industry and um, basically for mitigating less, less change. So uh, from George's article, I actually got, I don't think he's blaming consumers so much as blaming the, the corporations for the, the term carbon footprint, he, he says in this article that it's basically been devised as a propaganda campaign almost by the fossil fuel industry to push the responsibility onto to us. And yes, absolutely, we've got to do as much as we can to, to reduce that. But that isn't the main problem. You know, if everyone buys electric cars, there's still going to be more carbon in the atmosphere. So, yeah, I, 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 I you you said it a bit more that it was the consumers that needed to change their attitude on, which is also there, but I got a stronger sense from him that he was saying, actually, the 100 biggest corporations in the world that are doing a lot of the damage, they're the ones that need to change probably more than we do. Yeah, I guess it's the point he makes about how um, we have a tendency to frame the debate around personal responsibility yeah. as opposed to something that comes from corporations. I'm interested, though, in um, the point he, he makes in the article about 
Um, I suppose our addiction to growth or the capitalist system's addiction to growth, I wonder how you see that as a business leader, because of course growth is 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 a positive in, in business. You have grown your business as well. How do you make sure that growth aligns with your purpose? Yeah, it was a good question. And I have thought about this quite a lot for obvious reasons. Um, so uh, actually, our growth is carbon reducing, number one, because we're consolidating stuff that may have got to shops in lots of different vehicles and it, it comes in one. But our growth isn't, it, we're, we, people aren't eating more. Um, if they're buying the products we sell, they're just eating different products. I don't think we're encouraging people to eat twice as much as as what they were before. So on that level, we're not increasing the the GDP of the, the country with, with our growth in particular. Um, and the kind of growth he's talking about is this this um, the amassing of capital. So mm. shareholder primacy, it, they're not happy with profits staying the same year after year. That doesn't get them the returns they want. They have to always go after more and more and more profits, which means companies end up doing more and more extreme things to get those profits. That I think is the kind of growth we're talking. Well, we need to get away from GDP completely. It's a complete and utter nonsense. If you spread out all the GDP across the world, there's enough for everyone to eat and uh, and to reduce climate change as well. Um, so we need to completely move away from that as a measure of success because it isn't. And oh, in USA and the UK and many other Western nations, GDP has grown consistently over the years since the war. And yet there's a bigger gap between the rich and the poor than there the was then. And uh, I don't know if you know Kate Raworth's book, Donut, Donut Economics, uh, where she says, you know, the, obviously the poorer nations social problems we need to get them into the donut but the rich nations need to come out of the environmental they're outside the edge of the donut and need to pull back and we need to consume less that's what this article is about it's about mm. not just changing the way we consume but actually consuming less uh, you know I, i've got an electric car which i'm very happy with but i was just talking to some friends in the village the other day and said and this is the kind of conversation we need to to have on the back of this article. I said, look, we've we're uh, six of us, right, for three couples, and we've all got two cars parked on the drive. And most of the most of the time, there'll be at least two or three of those cars parked on the drive. We don't need six cars between six people. We could probably manage with two or three. So it's it's that moving to that completely different more community orientated mindset actually i mean that's what has gone horribly wrong in the west that people people have become far too individualistic and fearful and have to amass huge amounts of money and possessions they don't need if we ended up living more like many of the people in africa and asia and have spent a fair amount of time over there then we wouldn't have half the problems we have currently so it's it's all tight you can't separate climate change from all these other social problems we have in the world. Which brings me on to B Corp, actually, um, because I guess that is in particular one of the, the distinctive a- aspects of, of B Corp certification is that it's not trying to be a single issue label. It's not just trying to calculate your carbon footprint. It's not just trying to um, certify what, whatever you might be doing around mm. social causes or environmental causes, but it's it's sort of looking at a much more holistic picture. Was that one of the key things that attracted you to, to B Corp certification? And what impact has it had on, on your business when you're dealing with customers in particular? Okay, so I, well, to be honest, my first reaction was this sounds a bit American. I'm not, <laughs> sure, not sure I'm interested. But that, so Ed Perry, who's the founder of Cook, um, a friend of mine, he he introduced me to Beak Off, and that's when I had that reaction. Having looked into it, I thought, oh, it, it, it's a bit of a cliche, but it really did feel like coming home because this was everything I believed about what business should be. Here, here are some people that are actually doing it far better than than we ever have or probably ever will do so yeah just a massive amount of 
resonance really and and you're right it, it covers all the areas community um, workers governance environment and, and customers so it's a much more broad minded a certification than than anything else I'm aware of. I don't think there is anything else like that. And um, the other interesting thing about it is it's, it, and probably the, on reflection now, I didn't think it was great at the time, but um, now looking back, it's fantastic that the bar gets higher each mm. time you certify. So, for example, I noted we recertified um, earlier this year. And I noticed that there was quite a, a lot more in there this time on diversity and inclusion, which I don't think was there before, or certainly less questions on that. So, yes, they're bringing in new things into the certification, and you have to move forward to, to stay a B Corp. I mean, we were fortunate now, we're quite a long way above the line, but the first two certifications, we weren't that far above the pass line for B Corp. So, you know, we were paddling quickly to to keep to keep ahead of the the bar moving higher. So, in terms of custom, it, look, it, it's I used to get asked a lot, "How has being a B Corp benefited your business?" And my mm. and, and my answer generally was, it it hasn't actually got us more customers, but it's been massively helpful in bringing us together and people understanding our why and our purpose and getting what we're doing. But the last 12 months, it has actually helped us get more business. It is starting to uh, get us new customers, and there's a couple of big chunks of business we got this year. Then that's been a that's been a big factor in in their decision. So retailers generally probably aren't really there yet. I don't think they'd probably still save um, two or three percent on the price rather than going with someone who might be more sustainable. But you never know; things may even change in. Uh, in retail soon. <laughs> it certainly feels like there is growing recognition among consumers. It's still probably one of the lesser known certifications, but I think having more visibility, even on Ocado, for example, where you have a, yeah. a dedicated aisle for B Corp products, I mean, all of that um, adds adds visibility, doesn't yes. it? And, and hopefully will translate into, into more demand long term as well. Yeah, so there's definitely more brand awareness and the food and drink sector actually is the biggest sector in British B Corps there's over I think it's about 85 food and drink companies that are certified now which is far higher than any other sector in the UK so yes I think their brand awareness I think is in the 20s now in terms of recognition so it's a lot higher than it used to be And, and you can tell that when you you're at a trade show and you've got the B Corp logo and for five years what's that a B what (laughs) <laughs> and now, now people, oh yeah, B Corp, we know what that is. So, yeah. And actually talking about certifications and um, helping consumers make sense of more sustainable choices takes us on to the second article you picked, which is from BBC News. And the headline is Seven Ways to Spot Businesses Greenwashing. It's a very interesting list. I'm just, again, for listeners, quickly going to run through the seven telltale signs that they have identified in this article. So they are vague language and unsubstantiated claims. Images of nature or use of green buzzwords like eco or natural. Hiding information, particularly about supply chain impacts. Carbon offsetting. Small sustainable brands being owned by big corporations that aren't themselves very sustainable. A lack of transparency or information. And finally, recyclable or biodegradable packaging where the item is recyclable or biodegradable in theory, but it's actually not that easy in practice to recycle. Yeah. What did you make of this list? Did you agree with all of the telltale signs they identified? Yes. That my only one I would be slightly, I would probably check a bit, was the carbon offsetting. Mm. I think because we, we offset all, all our carbon and we're carbon neutral now it's not the it's not the solution but it's part of the journey to get to net zero so i think they were slightly harsh on the the carbon offsetting because this costs us a lot of money and it is it is doing things with carbon in other parts of the world that's where our money that we pay goes to so it's definitely not the final solution but it is a stepping stone on the way and part of being committed to that and called a carbon neutral company we commit to reducing our carbon each year on the journey to 
getting rid of it completely, which we hope to do by 2030. So, um, yes, that was the only one I probably thought, mm, hang on a minute, <laughs> it's better than doing nothing. <laughs> That, that's exactly, I, I'm so glad you picked up on that because that was also the, the question mark for me. Um, and again, I think the criticism around carbon offsetting is is, is justified. Um, and as you say, it is not the solution yeah. in and of itself. But I suppose it is also important to incentivize people to make some positive steps in the right direction rather than setting the bar so yeah. high that it that it becomes off-putting. I also thought of, that they were potentially a little bit harsh on images of nature or terms like eco or natural, because I suppose those are not necessarily signs that someone's greenwashing. They could be. And and I guess they're right to point out that just because you've got a lovely landscape or a lovely bit of pasture depicted on your product or you describe something as natural doesn't necessarily mean that it's uh, environmentally friendly. But I don't think it means it's necessarily greenwashing either. What did you mm. make of that? Well, it's front of mind when I read that was a program I watched recently um, that Joe Lysett did with Shell. I don't know if you saw that, but no, he, I didn't. He, he, well, you need to watch it and so do the listeners. Um, yeah, because if you look at the oil company adverts, you'll see all this greenery around. It is subliminal propaganda in my view, but I take your point on the, the maybe the companies that are less damaging to the planet than fossil I think fuel particularly in, Exactly, I think particularly in food and drink, I, I think those yeah, sort of words are, yeah. are reasonably are reasonably common. But I think I, I suppose it's perfectly right to tell consumers that actually don't assume that there is a compelling environmental story behind use um, of, of certain no, images. No, no. But images are powerful, aren't they? And um, I think, you know, they should be proportional in the ad to, to the company. So an oil company using pictures of fields and trees. So, yeah, I know they do a bit of sustainable energy, but it's insignificant compared to their, their main business. I mean, the, the only other one I would, you know, slightly checked, and I, I wrote it down in, in the margin, is the company ownership. Because... That you know, I know quite a few people at Innocent, and um, that is a a great company doing great things. And again, they would admit, yeah, sure, they can do more. Um, but they're owned by Coca Cola, so just because they're owned by Coca Cola doesn't mean we we should write them off. Maybe there'll be an example to Coca Cola, and Coca Cola actually might get better. And it's the same with a number of the Unilever subsidiaries like Ben and Jerry's and. Packety and things like that, you know, just because they're part of a bigger company um, doesn't mean they're not good, I don't think. No, I, and I think that's that absolutely that's that's a fair point. When you are vetting new brands, new products, new suppliers that you're potentially interested in working with, um, aside from B Corp, what are some of the credentials that you pay particular attention to and what would set off your alarm bells? Um, well, I mean, it, it's obviously that all the normal things like packaging, price, product, taste, all that, that's, that's a given. I, you're talking more about the sustainability yes, side. Yes, absolutely. I think, well, one thing that really annoys, because we deal with a lot, a lot of startups, and um, one thing that does wind me up, I must say, um, is when people say they're giving certain percentage or amount of money of their profits to a, a project and it's on the packaging and of course you ask them well, how, how are the profits oh we haven't made any money yet well don't say it then you, mm. you, i'll let you say it when when you're actually doing it don't you, don't put your aspirations on the packaging it's got to be it's got to be what <laughs> what's actually happening now so that that's one thing um I mean, again, there are certain products that still have to be in plastic. I mean, mainly chilled. I don't. There's not too many ambient products that have to be in plastic now, so we try and don't choose them. But there, you know, the technology is not quite there with wet products with shelf lives and uh, some of the biodegradable stuff. The product would end up loose in the fridge rather than in the, in the container. So, but yes, I mean, we do. We do actually. Um, offset all our plastic now as well even for our suppliers products um but we're gonna make them pay for that next year which will then have the additional effect of them reducing the plastic in there um yeah i mean obviously we drill down as as much as we can um and we have a, 
a survey they've got to complete. We have so many suppliers, we haven't got enough resources to go and physically check whether they're actually doing what they say. We, at the end of the day, it's a trust relationship and we have to believe what they say. We, we have pulled out the environmental section of the B Corp and made that into our own survey okay. to, to send to customers. And, um, and obviously, we are encouraging more and more suppliers before their suppliers and, and afterwards to go and do the B Corp assessment. In fact, we're starting a group next year, just suppliers, a, a cohort of 10 who are going to be taken through that process by someone who does that kind of thing. So, um, but yeah, I mean, to give you an idea of um, the growth of B Corps in our support, I think we had six at the beginning of COVID. Uh, we've now got 31 brands wow. that are B Corps. Now, some of that is us bringing them in. Quite a lot of it, though, is is us influencing suppliers to to get there. So we don't insist they do that before they become a supplier, but we then try and work with them as time goes on to to head them in in that direction. And to be honest with you, there's in the food and drink industry, really, that's what people want to do. You know, most people in this sector aren't doing it primarily for the money. They're doing it because they they love food and they they love producing stuff. So it is very well aligned to our sector, I think. Now, we're going to look at the third article, which is one I picked, and it's from Forbes. And the headline is, Small Businesses Get More Green, But Is the Customer Convinced? And it touches actually on a lot of the themes that we've already talked about. Um, So I won't run through those again, but there were two points raised here that I was really keen to talk to you about. One is that it references a survey from the Chartered Institute of Marketing, which found that 49% of marketers and our wary of working on sustainability campaigns for fear of being accused of greenwashing, which brings us back to the discussion we've just had. And the second point is that this article talks specifically about smaller companies and some of the challenges they face in telling their sustainability story. And you've already touched on how you are working with suppliers and also some of the credentials that you would be looking for as you vet suppliers and and the questions you'd be asking. But Have you found during the pandemic that actually there has been an increase in interest in sustainability from smaller suppliers? Or has the disruption um, just proved too much in in, in some cases that it's sort of taken a back seat? Yeah, there has. has. And surprisingly, um, it's been the biggest growth year of of b corps in the uk so i I don't know whether people just have more time on that and could go through the (laughs) the um assessment but it's been surprising actually how much people have been moving in that direction despite you know all the other stuff that's been thrown at them but i you know that it was very obvious to see wasn't it during lockdown that people were engaging with nature more they were you know, they had time to reflect. You know, a lot of us run around, around like headless chickens and, and people did have time to reflect and did maybe think a bit more about their consumer choices and um, businesses might finally be catching up. I mean, it, there was a survey, I think I think the date of this survey was actually around the time of the pandemic, maybe just before. But, um, and, and the, basically in, in a nutshell, um, businesses think consumers are sustainable but they only they think they're sustainable half as much as they actually are. So it was a big survey of loads of consumers, then 2,000 companies, and um, it was pretty much half. So businesses think consumers are making decisions based on sustainability, which they are, but they're actually doing it twice as often as businesses think they are. So maybe that kind of catch up as as is happening over the over the pandemic. That's so interesting because there certainly were some issues and we've talked about single use plastic that initially really did appear to be dropping off the agenda a little bit, particularly as hygiene fears were yeah. uh, were sort of very, very front of mind. And I suppose if I think about some of the more recent uh, stats on food waste, it does appear that, you know, initially during lockdown, the, the news or, or the stats around food waste um, was very positive. And as we've come out of lockdown, some of those old habits have perhaps crept in again. But if I read you correctly, you are, based on what you're seeing in the market, you think actually a lot of the changes we made during lockdown are going to prove um, long term. 
Yeah, well, certainly in, in the kind of smaller, medium food, mm-hmm. co- food drink company world, which is obviously the one that um, most of our suppliers are in, for sure. Yes, whether the big corporates are. And, you know, I, I was also drawn to that paragraph, actually, in, in the article, because, you know, too many companies put the sustainability thing in the marketing department. It's completely the wrong place. Sure, if if you're asking the marketing people to to do the work in that area, yeah, it's obviously greenwash, isn't it? Because it's got to infuse the whole company. Sure, the marketing people need to tell the story, but I do wonder how embedded the story is in these companies. Um, and I, I was talking to a, a CEO of one of the co-op groups the other day, actually, and they... I did challenge him on this because he, he had their sustainability people in his under his marketing director. I said, you can't do that. It's the wrong place for them. Um, and he, he had actually come to the same conclusion and decided to have them report direct to him, actually, which is I thought was a great step forward. And that's our impact manager re- is the only person not on the, the board that reports to me because – they can't be in a team. I want to make all my teams accountable in the sustainability area. So they they report directly to me. I think that's a really interesting point. And I suppose um, if I think about, I think there was actually someone from the Chartered Institute of Marketing writing a Saturday essay in the Grocer just this week, talking about almost a skills gap that sometimes gets in the way that um, you're absolutely right. It shouldn't be Um, the marketing department driving the sustainability initiatives, but they do have to find a way to communicate um, what's happening around sustainability. And if you have people who have never had anything to do with sustainability before, some of the stuff's quite difficult. It's quite complex to get your head around that. Um, Actually, there is some upskilling to be done, you know, not just in marketing departments, but across Mm. organizations to make sure that Actually, if there is a good story to be told, it can be told with with confidence. Yeah, but don't tell it until it's embedded in your company, and that does need driving forward for sure. We we you know we did it um, through mainly through creating groups challenging certain areas within the company. But yeah, you need people in the company who are driving forward. That shouldn't be the marketing people. Sure, when it's propagated through, they can tell the story. But mm-hmm. you know, clearly, what this article's talking about is is really people telling the story too Before soon they have a, uh, yeah. and, and consumers aren't stupid in fact they're more savvy now than they've ever been so they're going to see through all that greenwash and purpose wash and um, I hope they do because it needs calling out where necessary but the, the thing is it, it, the culture is never going to get there if companies main aim is to make money which it is for most companies um, they're legally that's all they can exist for. Um, so we're, we're trying to get something through Parliament currently called the Better Business Act, which would legally make companies to have to take account of people and the planet as well as profits as, as part of the company's act. And obviously, it'll take a while to, for that to go anywhere. But until that happens, and the main driver is shareholder pressure, wrong decisions will be made and greenwash will still happen. Paul, we're nearly out of time. Before I let you go, because you've talked so passionately about, um, I suppose, of changing the way we approach business, who do you admire in food and drink? Who who gets this right or who is doing things that are really pioneering or innovative? Um, well, I've mentioned, I have mentioned Ed Perry and yes. he, he, he's, um, yeah, I've known him for decades actually. And uh, so he he's, they became a B Corp a couple of years before us. Um, do a load of work with uh, prisoners. They quite a few ex uh, prisoners are in their kitchens making all those lovely meals. So he he's the first name that that came to mind, and that all the people actually in the in in Cook are massively inspirational. Um, Mark Cadogan at Ellis Kitchen is a a lovely guy, and has has taken you know the company was going before he was there but he's he's helped push them forward in in all sorts of areas so he's also an inspiration to me fantastic if listeners want to connect with you what's the best way to do that um so i've got a 
website, which is paulhargreaves.co.uk, which is my kind of personal speaking website. Um, it's probably the best one to to get hold of me. You'll get lost in the ether if you go through the, <laughs> either the uh, retail business or the wholesale business. So, yeah, my email's on on that website. Super. Paul, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much for being my guest. Thanks for having me. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the conversation and found it useful. If you did, please consider giving The Picklist a five-star rating on whichever platform you're listening and leave a review. It tells me you're enjoying the show and would like it to continue, and it helps me reach more listeners. If you'd like to connect, you can find me on LinkedIn at juliaglotz.com and on thepicklist.co.uk. And if you'd like more thought-provoking reads for your personal reading list, please subscribe to The Trim, my free weekly newsletter at juliaglotz.com forward slash newsletter. See you next time.